Okay. Hello, and welcome to Blue Stream bringing Willamette to you. My name is Tiffany Newton. I'm the engagement team leader here at Willamette and also the director of graduate alumni engagement. We're really excited that you can join us. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature or submit them via the chat, and I will hand things off to my colleague, Patty Whitcomb. Hi there, welcome everybody. Um, we all know that we've been experiencing a really tumultuous 18 plus months, but today is hopefully going to be a good positive spin on what's been happening across businesses and even what's been happening across some of our corporate cultures. Um, you know, we've experienced inconveniences in a myriad of ways from not having our favorite products available to us that we desperately need. Um, you know, but also there's been significant stress caused by businesses and jobs being completely appended. Um, today we have Eric Forrest, alum of 1994 from Atkinson and co-president of Bigfoot Beverages, headquartered out of Eugene. Given his leadership role in a distribution company, he's going to share about ways he's led both of his employees and also his customers um, through this time and how they're still continuing to do so. Um, however, we're also going to hear how they're hopefully doing better and hopefully stronger for it in the long run. Additionally, we've all seen an uptick um, in headlines about companies and either their business heads not acting so ethically or some other you know, lack of corporate social responsibility. Eric and Bigfoot Beverages are exceptions to that headline making trend. And we're also excited to hear about ways that he and his senior leadership team are instilling good culture um, at their company. And also through some of Eric's personal service. Um, to interview Eric, we have Gianna Marques. Um, she's a special um, student guest. Um, she's a first year MBA candidate who's also a senior at Willamette. So that means that she's part of our 3-2 program. Um, she played softball and she's also an MBA ambassador. And currently this year, um, she was a scholarship recipient of the Eric and Kristen Forrest Family Annual Scholarship. Um, she's thinking about focusing on marketing. And this past summer, she was in LA interning as a film marketer. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. So Gianna and Eric, take it away. Cool. Um, okay, so I think we should just start with like maybe share your college experience and how you got to Willamette and just so we can kind of like relate on that route. Sure. Um, probably more than you want. I know I, I grew up in uh, Roseburg, Oregon, so native Oregonian. Uh, went to Oregon State University. Uh, spent a couple of years working for uh, way back when in something called telecommunications selling long distance for MCI. So I did corporate account sales for a couple of years. And uh, my wife and I were living out in Phoenix and she wanted to get a master's of arts in teaching. And I wanted to do an MBA program. And the nexus was Willamette. So there, that was the program in the state of Oregon that had that. And we were, well, she wasn't lucky to get in. She deserved to get in. I was lucky enough to get in. And so uh, so the, the two of us moved to Salem and uh, put down roots here for a couple of years. And then... Um, do you want a little more background on what I do now? Or? Sure, yeah. All right, absolutely. Uh, so and then went into uh, actually her family's business. So it started in 1947. Uh, Kristen and I met at the orthodontist office in middle school. So that's... Uh, yeah. so, that's <laughs> we dated on and off. So it wasn't always on. But, uh, but uh, got married and I had actually accepted a job offer in Portland coming out of the MBA program. And her father was... He already retired and offered me the opportunity to come into business. So, again, the business started in 1947. Her grandfather had a prune orchard. Uh, so, he started bottling Pepsi and what we call a prune dryer, basically kind of a barn, and uh, started bottling Pepsi Cola back then. And so, uh, I'm in the coming to business in 1994, currently serve as co president, and also, in terms of questions, also serve on the board of Columbia Bank, which if you're following things, just announced uh, a combination with Umpaw Bank, so it could handle some banking questions as long as they're not too deep. Uh, so I do that, and I chair the Oregon Beverage Recycling Co-op, so it's the entity that manages the bottle bill for the state of Oregon, uh, and then also currently serve on the Ford Family Foundation, which is a foundation serving rural Oregon uh, and based out of Roseburg, um, set, up, uh, set, up really, set up in the 50s really got rolling in 1994. Sam. 
Yeah, for Bigfoot beverages, are you still focused on bottling or what other avenues have you gone through in the beverage industry? That's a great question. So we, in terms of what we do, as you've seen or have read about, you know, there's uh, huge advantages in scale. So originally, each of our facilities, so we operate in, a, in 11 counties in Oregon, everybody always used to have their own little bottling line. And then over time, they've consolidated to the point now where there's a cooperative that serves the Northwest. So we are an owner in a cooperative that produces mainly carbonated soft drinks and Aquafina water based out of Tumwater and then not far from here, Mount Angel, Oregon. So we have that, that production side. Um, and I sat on that board for years. Now my partner does. But uh, so we that was formed. And then the remainder of our products come from outside sources. So the products we're making are things you can think of like Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, Mountain Dew, Waters, I mentioned, Lipton Brisk Tea. But then things like Starbucks, Gatorade, those items come through what we call contract ops. So come through the PepsiCo system. And then we branched out into other, other products that are outside of PepsiCo. So things like Celsius, C4, you know, that, that are energy drinks. We do home kombucha, we do all kinds of chill. And then, uh, and then nine years ago, uh, we decided to get into the craft beer space. And that has really evolved over time to where now we uh, represent 90 different breweries. Um, the, the bulk of what we sell is, is brewed in Oregon, but also California, Washington, and, and some imports. And it's to the point now where that, that beer portion of our business is about 30% of our revenue. So it's it's really grown a lot the past nine years. Cool. So that's primarily distribution these days? Yes. So we, we do have, you know, we do have our, our finger still. We definitely follow the production side because of our membership in that co-op uh, and then, then focus on distribution as well as it's a different form of, of distribution, but we also do uh, online vending. So if you workplace, uh, large employers to even small employers, but snack, coffee, all, all that type of stuff too. So again, another line of distribution. Okay, um, we're gonna move into some supply chain questions specifically, and we have some different like sections of questions and things, but just raise your hand if you wanna say something else. Um, okay, so you've had distributions in both uh, or disruptions in both distribution and manufacturing of your products at Bigfoot Beverages. Can you share what the supply chain model looked like pre-COVID compared to now? Sure. Um, so when I was just talking about that production cooperative, normally uh, pre-COVID, our out-of-stock rates, so when we ordered something in terms of what our expectation is, was less than 1% out-of-stock as we rolled into COVID. Once about three months into COVID, we were up to a 20% out of stock rate. And so it, it really turned things on, on its ear and it's really continued on. It's gotten better. Um, but it, you know, it started with the fact that people, you know, there was a consumer shift, right? So people were going out, they were buying products in a different form. Now everybody's home. So all of a sudden, all the packaged goods, the, the volume goes up. And as as businesses will do in terms of trying to do lean production, production have been scaled down in the United States, figuring on aluminum can production is going to grow 2% this year. That might have been out, or it might have been for carbonated soft drinks, maybe it's going to decline 2% because other things are growing. Well, now all of a sudden, when things go, when demand goes up 10%, that 8% delta creates huge issues. So it starts creating out of stocks everywhere. And so I, I pulled up some numbers. We, so when we were in worst case scenario on COVID, so uh, July of 2020, so 12 pack pops, carbonated soft drinks that you're all familiar with, we had five items we could sell. Today, now that we've kind of been able to scale back up and figure it out, we have 37. So we had, we've gone all the way down to shelf, shelf space in, in the grocery store, down to just trying to fill in that shelf with five items. It's, what's crazy is, so say so we had five items, you think, gosh, you know, your volume had to go down. You had to be doing 20% of what you did before. We were actually at 97% of previous year. And now that we've finally been able to get a little more in stock, find other supply for aluminum, this year we're at 45% over that previous year on 12 packs. So there's really consumer demand right now. People are not going out as much to restaurants they're consuming at home, of course, as we've all read about, there's more cash in the system right now in terms of consumer cash. And so I think people are able to spend it on what we call an affordable luxury on that side. Another 
example is if you want to have a sleepless night when the governor shut down uh, restaurants, we had 5,500 kegs of beer in the cooler. So when you think about 5,500 kegs, you're talking about $800,000 worth of inventory. And it's got a shelf life of um, IPA in 90 days. And you're trying to figure out how long is the shutdown going to go? Where are we going to push these kegs? So during that period, you work with some of your brewers. They figure out to take some of those kegs back, put it into uh, cans or bottles. And you know, it, was, it was pretty stressful trying, trying to figure it all out. But overall, beer volume stayed up. People were consuming at home. It would go to package. And a lot of folks that might have been draft only were figuring out, they figured out through the pandemic, they made a move that they were planning on making. They figured out how to get into packaged beer. And now coming, as things are getting a little more back to normal, they have a more balanced portfolio. And they figured, so now they have both the draft, the keg, as well as the package. So there were some positives coming out of that. Absolutely. Uh, you talked about the aluminum shortage slightly. Uh, yeah. What did you do to uh, like change your supplier uh, and where do you look for? So, we, so PepsiCo has an organization called Global Procurement. So by the name, they're globally sourcing materials and what they ended up doing on our behalf for a production co-op. And so over time, we were getting cans from as far away from, as, as Dubai. So you know, now we're, we're, they found international can sources. It's driven up cost of goods. I mean, we're looking at potentially right now, it looks like a 20% increase in cost of goods. So you got to figure out how to do that with, on the retail side. But then you had two months ago, there was an over, overthrow of the government in Guinea. Well, Guinea is one of the world's largest suppliers of aluminum. So all of a sudden, aluminum had already gone high priced. Now you have that happen, serious market disruption. And so the aluminum price has gone again. So, but it, the answer is they, they, they went more globally. And you're seeing right now, uh, Ball and some other container companies are, are building can manufacturing in the States, but it takes 24 or 36 months to get a manufacturing facility up. And I think the interesting thing will be to watch and see, is there that whipsaw? So you're chasing the demand, you're seeing that it's going up. If things return back to normal, if we get back to the way things felt in 2019, 2018, are people going to be, are their consumption habits going to go back? And all of a sudden, we might have a glut of can capacity out there in the system. So it could drive price down. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Are there any other raw materials that you're short of with this one? Yeah. So right now, if you go to the grocery store and try to buy uh, Starbucks 15 ounce glass, so the the frappuccino and the big glass bottle. Good luck. If you find it, <laughs> buy all you. If you're a consumer, buy it, put it away. Because uh, we've been shorted on that for <laughs> months right now. Uh, at Lipton Tea, the pure leaf bottle, it's kind of a square bottle, 18 ounce bottle. You go into a convenience store right now, we might have one flavor. And so we have consumers out there that are, that are struggling to find that. But I said that about Frappuccino. Overall, Starbucks, if you look at the, the brand's health in terms of package, we're up 8% this year, and we haven't had it in, in that package size in glass. So consumers consumers are moving, finding other things. That when they go in, it's a it's a purchase opportunity, consumption opportunity, so they, they find something else to buy. The worry is from a brand health standpoint is that then their their habits shift, and then are you going to get that 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 consumer back into maybe what was a more profitable package? And probably the biggest right now, Gatorade. If you look at Gatorade out a lot on the shelves, you just saw in the stock market, Body Armor just sold for a market cap of eight billion dollars to Coca Cola, and they've been getting, Body Armor's been gaining space through this whole shortage because they had a better supply chain. So Gatorade had been a seventy share nationally down to like a 65, is that going to start a trend? Are consumers moving over to body armor? How is Gatorade going to come out of this as they're building up capacity because they have problems with their 20 ounce bottle trying to get the supply of that? Go ahead, Jesse. You said that uh, beer and like local brews have become about 30% of the uh, profits recently. Yeah. Um, do you think that these breweries that are just starting now to bottle their beer, do you think they're going to continue to do so even after the pandemic? Uh, yeah, I think they will. I mean, there's good mobile canning options. <coughs> I mean, there's this whole industry out there where you brew your beer and your, your beer is ready. A person pulls up with a trailer that's set up to do mobile canning. So they, 
they can your beer. Basically, a hose goes into this canning, this mobile canning uh, operation, and, and they'll, they'll can your beer. So I, I, I do think that those folks uh, will, will stay doing that. Arch, Arch Rock, small brewery, south coast of Oregon, uh, they, they had always been draft. They switched over to that, and they've seen now that draft is coming back, they, now they have a package consumer, too. So I think that they'll stick around like that. One of our online folks is asking, do you hedge for material prices like aluminum given? Um, so we do not hedge. However, that global procurement organization I was talking about, they are in fact hedging. So I would say our procurer, uh, who we are contractually obliged to source through, they are hedging. Um, probably the, the main raw material for our business that somehow isn't being hedged would be fuel. We would never hedge fuel or try to make a bet on that. Okay. My uh, partner and I recently started a small beverage, I need to long cold brew coffee. Um, yeah. One of the major hurdles we're facing right now is trying to find the right containers or get, you know, we'll sell product containers. Do you have any recommendations on what we should shoot for and follow up? Any just general recommendations in starting up a, a beverage company? You're great. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, and that's, that's a growing space. I mean, I'll get back to the question, but if you go into grocery stores right now, there's more and more space for chilled single serve coffees. You guys know, I mean, it's got the local startup Riff out of Bend who's, who's in that space. And you're seeing, you know, Stumptown got into it earlier. So there is opportunity there. Uh, and from my perspective, I would avoid glass. I would focus on can. Uh, I, think, I think consumers generally prefer can. And especially now in terms of environmental responsibility, I think we can all get our head around how a, a, a can can be uh, recycled and you can see it go through the process. I think glass just by its nature, when I, the work I do at OBRC that collects the bottles, uh, glass is the lowest redemption rate. So plastic and aluminum are gonna redeem it at a 90 rate in the state of Oregon. Um, we are the highest in the United States, but it will, it will redeem at that rate. Glass could be down more in the 70s. Um, and so I think consumers are wise to that and are going to get continue to get more and more wise to it. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Sam, did you have a question? Yeah. So with cans, you said it's 90% uh, recyclable. What is that? Does that go to making more cans in the future? Or what is, what is the recycling? So there's a, a market out there. Uh, and you are usually, you know, for instance, with OBRC, we probably have one large purchaser and a couple other purchasers because you never want to you never want to sell all your supply to one individual because that can be a situation where you're more vulnerable. Um, I would say most of it probably goes back into can. I can't speak to where it goes. I mean, as a for instance, we also on the PET side, on the plastic side, we it's a it's a great story in Oregon. We so 90% gets recycled. And then we're also OVRC as a partner with Merlin Plastics in a business called Orpep, which is in St. Helens, Oregon. So we take that plastic, take it, it gets bailed, you take it to St. Helens, now it gets turned into flake, and that flake gets sold out on the recycle market. But right now, a lot of that flake is going to carpet fiber. And so we're working on taking it the next step where we can turn that into pellet and take it directly to bottles. So really, we're working on right now a, kind of a, a true cradle to grave, uh, the cradle story with PET. Uh, so that folks in the state of Oregon know that it, it turns back, back to stewardship and something I feel really passionate about that, you know, this year we'll recycle 2 billion containers in the state of Oregon. You know, it's pretty amazing uh, that, at no cost to consumers. So there's no, the state, they have one person in the OLCC that's responsible for the bottle bill and that's a sum total of state subsidy on it, all, all handled by industry and consumers returning, so. Okay, so according to Moody's Analytics, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Do you agree with this with the beverage industry? I got that question in the pre-read. That's just <laughs> dark. Um, <laughs> 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 oh, I hate Mr. Moody. Yeah, no. Um, so I would say for us, I want to paint a pretty good picture. I mean, it's our, our business has been up through the pandemic. Um, we're finding a way, you know, labor, yeah, that's been tough, but we've been able to run all of our runs. Uh, we've seen wage increase. Uh, I'm more concerned about inflation in terms of what's going to happen there. 
And so that's that's probably the largest concern. I do have concern on other um, ancillary or items outside of cost of goods. It's not ancillary, it's key, is would be tractors. So right now we so our Kenworth tractors that pull our trailers. We had six more left on order this year. Those have been canceled with no future date and the orders we had in for 2022 have all been canceled. So they are not guaranteeing that, that we will be able to buy any new tractors. So you start thinking out there in the supply chain, if you have you know, all these companies that have got to get materials and products to market and you know, tractors are going to break down and we're already seeing it. So now that means we've got to buy more replacement tires. Well, tires are hard to come by because if we're running our existing fleet, that means we need more tires. So I, I'm concerned about some of those items. Forklifts are a year lead time. If you want racks for your warehouse, probably a year lead time. So those are the things that, that scare me more than our base business on raw materials. It's gonna be on, on those other items. Do you believe you put yourself in a better position with being more like 30% beer sales or just kind of alcohol, just with pandemic, you just usually see an increase of alcohol sales during those times? You know, even outside of pandemic related, I, mean, I think that has been in the, my time in the business in terms of vision. Our vision has been to become less dependent on a single street. So when when myself and my partner, uh, Andy Moore, the other co-president, when we started the business, about 90 percent of our revenue came through PepsiCo. And so now when I pull a report, only about 50% of our revenue comes from PepsiCo. So you've got the, that beer side, you got that full end vending side I was talking about, you got chill products. So I think it's good to hedge your bets. Um, and so, because what we had been seeing on carbonated soft drinks, which you know, when I started in 94, that was soft drinks were still way up here. And it's not like soft drinks are dead, but they just have been slowly eroding. And I always make the argument, maybe soft drinks aren't eroding if you throw energy drinks into it. Because when I was growing up, Mountain Dew was the energy drink. And that's if somebody needed a pump. You know, I, I drank two Mountain Dews last night. Wow. <laughs> so now you're selling 300 milligram caffeine items, C4, and it makes your face tingle. You know, you're saying, what is, what, what is this? <laughs> so in a way, that's a carbonated soft drink. It is a carbonated soft drink. People are using it for the for the same uh, return and and at the same use occasions. So, and that's another way of trying uh, to hedge your bets in those categories. And we've tried to find more and more energy drinks where we can. Cool. Okay. So we're going to transition a little bit to more like leadership based questions. So. Um, Curious how your role as president and co-founder evolved at Bigfoot and how you put your stamp on the company itself. Um, you know, I certainly feel very fortunate as I talked about it. Uh, we had a good base starting in 1947. So I think mainly tried to be a good steward of the opportunity we had. And so that's from a business standpoint, uh, a lot of the stuff that I learned here, I mean, there's economies of scale. And so if you've got a truck stopping, you got a certain amount of time that's just part of that stop. So the way that you can make more money is to drop more boxes for that stop because your driver is going to have to check in in the back. And that's there's a whole process there. You're going to have to restart the truck, reseal everything up. So if you were dropping 300 cases, if you can drop 500 cases, you're going to be more profitable. And so that's really uh, one of the things that has been our vision and I, and I think was a step change from what had been going on for, for the previous years. Uh, in terms of leadership, you know, that's, we've got a great team and I think a lot of what you will learn here, what I remember is how to work in groups because uh, I got stuck in a lot of groups. And <laughs> previously, you know, like I said, I've been doing sales, kind of been doing my own thing. And that, that learning about being in a group, uh, you know, listen to learn, not listen to answer the question or answer what somebody's saying, uh, be willing to step back, to let others step forward, uh, you know, trying to get all the voices because you're, you're a lot stronger organization if you are, are hearing from all facets. 
you know, that's that, that sense of internal community as well as external community. So you, you need to have a, a community at work where people feel safe uh, to speak their mind, tell you what's wrong. Uh, and then the, the sense of family and, and, and then that sense of family was, was always there, but I think we're one of the last companies around, hopefully we'll get to have one next year, but still has holiday parties. We bring in every one of our employees from all of our locations. We're now out to the stadium, the club room up there, and we have a holiday party. And just to still have that sense of coming together is something that I, I really don't ever want to get rid of. And, and I think it means a lot to our team uh, that both symbolically and just the opportunity to, to, to spend time together. Would you mind touching on your relationship a little more with Andy Moore and um, the yeah. leadership team? So here's the deal. When you look at organizational structure or development, I don't think you probably see a hierarchy that's got co-presidents. And you know, that's really fraught with uh, opportunity for failure. And when I started, uh, Andy started a year later. So our families had become partners in 1988 to make a bigger enterprise. And Andy and I didn't know one another. And eight years later, we're co-presidents. And I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. Andy is the godfather of my youngest child. We've never had an argument at work. We talk it out till we solve it. And, uh, and we, I think the other key thing is for your team to know that it's safe, even if it's my quote unquote direct report on the org chart, if they have a conversation with Andy and I'm not available and they make a decision, you know, that's, that's great. I'm good. I'm on board. So that, that's really been the key to having a good partnership. And uh, as a side note, Andy and my wife were born on the same exact day. So I live 24 hours a day with the same human. I mean, they, uh, <laughs> so, so things are good at home, too. Yeah. <laughs> so um, how do you as an individual or you and Andy together, like, foster culture within Bigfoot? Uh, kind of alluded to that, but I, I think at a senior exec level, we, we are very open. We sit uh, together, have conversations, create shared vision, uh, make sure that it's our plan, not my plan, uh, and try to carry that down through the organization, uh, really try to allow people the, the freedom to, to think uh, outside the box, I, I, the terminology, but to, um, to allow them to come up with solutions and tools. I mean, uh, for instance, is our group in Eugene, I started using Microsoft Teams uh, for our for our our sales folks. Our sales folks aren't traditionally uh, a team that probably would normally engage with Microsoft Teams, and so now every team, every salesperson throughout the company has an iPad. But our sales team is utilizing their iPad, using Teams, and they've scaled the data so that if it's only you're only getting communication if it involves your account. We're sharing pictures of successes during the day. And so they can celebrate that with one another and also, frankly, be able to copy that idea and take it to another account and say, hey, here's what's going on down the street. So you know, just allow not, not having those ideas to have to be start at the very top, but allow it to be organic. Thanks. So um, did that kind of help? I mean, with COVID and everything, that culture just help with the motivation of the team in general? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm very proud of our team getting through COVID. I'm not going to lie to anybody that wasn't really hard. Um, you know, there was a, a lot happening. Uh, and as you know, throughout this, there's been a lot of opinions that have become you know, strong emotional lightning rods and conversationally. And so dealing with that in the workplace, whether that's about vaccination or whether how serious COVID is or all those items, trying to keep the workplace about work, trying to keep those conversations uh, on the outside of the building. And you know, our team pulled together. Uh, as I said, we, we didn't have any major outbreaks, uh, kept things contained, followed the protocols, uh, and, and proud of how everybody handled that. And I would say from a management standpoint, we, we offered at different times and incentives, if you will, uh, regarding COVID uh, in terms of when the, that first June and July, when things really heated up, uh, offered a, a pay bump to the team for that interim period of time. Uh, we, we did this summer, uh, we did a hundred days of summer program where, where if you, if, if you stuck it out for a hundred days, you got a bonus at the end, things that we hadn't done in the past, but understanding that 
you know, it's it's tough some days getting up and coming into work and dealing with what's going on and, and, and dealing with COVID and, and all the pressures that are out there. So, kind of, kind of. Um, awesome. And then, uh, is, was that just mainly for the purpose of uh, uh, retention right now, especially just because retention rates? Um, I, I would say certainly retention. I would say also recognition. I mean, it's it's both sides uh, that you're recognizing. Uh, one, uh, that everybody's putting out extra effort. I mean, as I mentioned, our, our volume was up significantly through this. We're having a hard time hiring people. So people are working more overtime than they might like. So you're trying to find ways to recognize that as well as looking at, hey, you know, it's it's a tough job market out there. We got to make sure that we're trying to keep people still part of the Bigfoot team. So, that you know, that, I would say it's sort of two purposes. We have a question online. Um from Lauren, we've been learning how employee behavior is changing, especially with the comparison of waterfall management to agile management. How has Bigfoot dealt with this shift? And then the second part is also how has COVID affected employee behavior of maybe wanting more time off or using a hybrid system of being at home versus online? Um, so I, I'm getting old. I have a short memory. I'll take the last part first. <laughs> um, you know, we... Uh, we did a little bit, we had a few folks that could work at home. And so we did that. But by and large, because of being in a distribution business and it's kind of all hands on deck, um, we don't have some of the same things like being on the bank board, Columbia Bank, that you had more opportunity for folks to work from home. It kind of becomes uh, a larger issue. And so uh, at Bigfoot, we, I would say it wasn't that big an issue because everybody was pretty much at work every day. Uh, just did what we could. We had a large enough facility to create uh, social distancing in the, in the workplace. And so that, that was helpful. We didn't have cubes stacked on top of one another. At the bank, uh, made a conscious decision to try to keep as many people as possible or customer facing in the bank and try to keep the branches open. And I think that's re rewarded us in terms of what we're seeing in the deposit base and, and our customers wanting to have a place to, to come in uh, and versus competition. So I, I, I think if I was putting a different hat on from the bank side, I would be proud of that. Waterfall management versus agile management. I think I prefer agile, but I don't necessarily know the definitions, but I'm a big fan of being agile. <laughs> so my, I'm, I'm kidding, but I'm, I'm assuming you're talking hierarchical versus a flatter organization. And we strove to be, we strive to be a flat organization. Uh, and, and that's, uh, I think that's industry wide. I mean, if I look at our neighboring baller PBC, which is owned by PepsiCo. PepsiCo owns 80% of the franchise system. We're a franchisee, we're part of that other 20. They, they continue to flatten out. And I think you, one, people prefer that now, uh, as well as we have the tools to do that. And the ability to communicate now, again, dating myself, but when, when I first started at, at, at what wasn't called Bigfoot Inc., we changed the name nine years ago, but at Willamette Beverage, you know, there I I had a pager and somebody wrote my messages down. You know, they had on the box and there was they were just getting emails. So you know, now you think about where we're at and the ability to communicate communicate quickly. Uh, I think we continue to try to become more and more of an agile uh, management structure. In fact, talk about the co presidency. We've gone to a, a co management strategy at our largest branch facility, which is over in Bend, uh, instead of having one person and having a team like this, we've got two folks and a flatter team going out. And, and, and I think it's so far been very successful. Yeah, uh, so that's actually a good transition. We've been talking about uh, where to play and how to play extensively. Um, I just would like you to expand on your where and how to play uh, during COVID and even the uh, RFP headquarters, which I know you're not a part of, but has moved their headquarters to Eugene, mm -hmm. and the Ford Family Foundation hasn't, and just the differences in there um, on where and how to play. Yeah. Well, something like the Ford Family Foundation, so if you look at core mission values, it's about rural Oregon, and so we are committed to being as an organization in rural Oregon. And so Eugene would not be considered rural and Roseburg is our roots. And so it's, it's a very strong, firm commitment to stay rural. So if you think about where to play, uh, it, it, it has uh, resonance with the mission as well as it demonstrates 
you know, your, your walk and your talk. And so I, that's very important there. I can see for, not to speak for Rosemary Forest products, but from a recruiting standpoint and, and, and being able to retain and hire people, especially in the environment right now, where Eugene with an airport uh, and with more amenities, uh, we haven't grown up in Roseburg, I'm not throwing Roseburg under the bus, but having a university, having a whole center, having you know, a lot of broader based community events, I think is a, would be a recruiting advantage. So you, you gotta make, people are your number one piece of capital. So you've gotta make sure that you are setting up the organization to be able to successful and be able to, to recruit. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, any other part of that question? That, uh, that, that covered it. Okay. That covered it. <laughs> Another question over here. Follow up. Okay, Michael. Well, I was just wondering about your philanthropic efforts, both as on the personal level with the boards and stuff you're involved in, but also as your company, what efforts have you put into that and how has the COVID year and a half challenged that? Yeah. Um, so we, we have stayed at the same level of philanthropy. Uh, we have, my, my wife is a, a CASA court appointed special advocate and has served on the board and, and we're as a family involved in CASA. And so we, stayed involved with those. Obviously, they've had to do more remote things too. Um, philanthrop philanthropically, really through Bigfoot as well as personally, we really try to focus on things that involve youth, children. Uh, and that's, I think you have to be focused. Not to say we don't support other events in the community with, with beverage and sampling and, and those items, but it's it's core to us to, to, to support kids. And I think that's that's where a, a healthy, vibrant community starts. Is if you, I mean, if you can get kids in a in a good place when they are starting kindergarten, you got a darn good chance of having a healthy, happy adult, and and, and that that means a lot for your community. So that's that's been our focus. I do know it's been hard on philanthropy uh, in terms of raising money, and we've done some additional gifts uh, to try to help out with that, um, where they weren't able to have their annual fundraiser in person. I will say what's amazing in terms of pivoting, being involved with a few of those organizations, the online fundraiser, if you put together a good auction online, you cut out a lot of the food costs, you cut out so many pieces of overhead and people still want to participate and donate. And in the end, when you look at the net, the net has been better than it was with the traditional in-person event. Now you lose the opportunity to spread your mission and get people together and you know, there's there, there's a big piece to that. I don't know if that's a great long range plan, but I've really been surprised and pleased to see that. Kind of leads into our next question too, because you can see on the website that Bigfoot Beverage is committed to community and um, community service, um, growth and brand development. So um, what other ways does your company approach corporate social responsibility? Well, I think the biggest way so I talked about was mm -hmm. the bottle bill. Um, yeah. You know, that's, I don't know, you know, you're, most of you are are fairly young in terms of how the bottle bill has changed over time, but you know it's the bottle bill has morphed into where you used to go bring your bottles into the grocery store and you walk to the back and the grocery store had a bottle. They called him the bottle boy. It's, it's not gender appropriate bottle person, but that was the the job. And they would take your bottles and they'd go in and count them and, and they would come back out and tell you how much you had. You think about now to where we are because we understand where consumers are. We want to continue to increase redemption rates. There's a dip. And we've got 25 centers across the state of Oregon, bottle drop centers. You got one in South Salem, you got one in North Salem where you can take those containers in, you can put them in a bag, you drop them off, they get counted, they go into an online account you have, you can donate that money, you can put it in a blue colored bag and that, that's got a sticker on it for your preferred charity. So trying to find ways to not only make sure that we are EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, which is a buzzword right now. And we've been an EPR since 1971. So we're trying to make sure that we are, 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 are meeting up to our responsibility on that. In terms of uh, Bigfoot and the, why community is first, it's just what I mentioned about kids. If we don't have healthy communities, our business isn't going to grow. We're a franchise territory, so that means we've got a certain area. 
and probably aren't going to get a bigger area from Pepsi. So we need healthy communities where we live. Not only do we care about our communities just innately and it's part of who we are, but it's also good for our bottom line. So you've got to make sure that you've got a, a, a good, healthy community and you're doing your part. And there's fewer and fewer local businesses any longer. So, you know, it's, it's more, as consolidation happens, there's fewer and fewer likely suspects. And we, and we take being a likely suspect serious and want, and want to be a part of the solution in our community. So that's, that, that's important to us. I would love, thought about it right now is not the time with labor shortages, but you know, many banks, the Columbia Bank I'm involved with, they give you 40 hours a, a year that's paid time to volunteer in your community. I love that idea. And so it would be like to see how we can get, we do that. We have a, a day of caring with United Way, but it would be great to figure out how to, to bring that to Bigfoot where people, if they wanted to, could take take a week out of their year in different increments and volunteer in the community. I, I think that would be really healthy and cool. Um, can you tie any of these efforts back to core business objectives? Maybe some that you've you've learned from, from Atkinson or just like your experience? The philanthropy? Yeah, your just like your corporate social responsibility yeah. efforts and philanthropy. Yeah. Well, yeah, again, back to that darn model bill. I yeah. mean, it, 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 it pays for us versus having a system like California. I mean, when we don't we don't have uh, a middleman who's running these redemption centers. We don't have a handling fee. It's good for consumers because it brings their costs down. It's good for us because it, it brings our bottom line costs down. And yeah, would it be great, great, just pure bottom line if they just went away? Sure, but that's not, you're not being a, a, a good corporate steward as well as we found a way where it's not costing us any money and we're getting to the end goals and there's not an incremental cost on top. So I think those items and and frankly as well, you know, it's kind of quieted down during the pandemic, uh, the obesity issue that the, you know, the soft drink industry had been tagged with for years. But it's smart over time to morph your portfolio. We understand what's going on and we need to be good stewards. And if we're going to stay alive in business, we've got to have more and more locale options. And so that, uh, from that standpoint, has been important to us. And that was when we got into kombucha. There, we, I think we were the first Pepsi bottler I know that got into kombucha. We're looking, well, that, you know, better for you drink, based out of Bend, um, hum kombucha. So there was an opportunity that made good bottom line sense as well as offer a, a healthier option. Are you, do we need to save any time for more questions or should we just keep going? Keep going. Okay. Yeah. yeah questions. I have a question about a um, few things that you had mentioned retention and recruitment are important, and I'm focusing in on HR myself. Uh, where do you see HR's uh, position in your, your organization's bank or beverage, as well as their role? So I would say. 15 years ago, I think HR was, they were the hiring department. And now in both organizations, they're an absolute thought partner throughout the organization. And, and as I mentioned before, in terms of capital, the most important capital you can have is good people who are engaged to believe in the culture. And so that to me, we, we spend a lot of time discussing probably softer issues and just, all right, how many openings do we have? How many you got coming in? I mean, it's got to be about how are people feeling? Are, you know, are our health benefits meeting the needs? Where are we at on, you know, our, 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 our sick leave policy? All the things, there, there's so many items as well as just taking the temperature of the overall organization. And so, you know, that's, it's very important and, and it's going to, be more and more important for our business specifically. I mean, we're finding a truck driver was hard pre-pandemic, obviously really hard right now, but going forward, finding that the generation that's coming into the workforce, there's a balance of, that looks pretty stressful, driving a tractor and a trailer, and yeah, you might pay me $3 more an hour than if I do this other job in the company, but I'd rather have the emotional well-being of not being stressed out driving that tractor trailer. Well, before, People are like, yeah, I want, want that incremental money. Now you have folks that are balancing their emotional wellness with, with their financial wellness. So it's going to be very important with HR to be thinking about they will be getting more involved in, in 
business practices in terms of okay, how can we think about this? This is what I'm hearing from the team, from the folks I'm working with. Are there ways that we can break up the business in a different manner so that we can retain more people and get to the same ends and keep a healthy, happy labor force? So yeah, it's it's so, not that it's more important, but it's definitely, I think we all realize how valuable it, it is now, just continuing more and more valuable as the workforce the boomers get old and we have fewer and fewer folks coming in. Okay, um, this is more of a question about you as an individual, but um, how can you describe how you behave a bit differently as a senior leader of the company versus being a board member? Um, yeah, I'll take the board member part as a contrast. You know, when you're a board member, I, as you all get involved in boards in your career, may, one of the first things you got to remember is you have one employee. And so a board needs to concern themselves with whether it's the executive director or the city manager or the school superintendent or the CEO of the company. That's your, you, that's your one person. And you need to respect the fact that that person who reports to you, they're in charge of their team. Now you can give advice. You, things will come up that you'll chat about. Uh, they'll want your advice as a board member, but don't go down in the organization. That's not your job. And, and that, that creates big issues for your hired executive. And so that's different than being a senior leader of a company where I, I am down lower in the organization on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. I would recommend, um, not that I do this in which you should do it in the business, but, but don't try to prove yourself to be the smartest person in the room. I mean, that's, I think there are folks that get on boards and we all have a, you know, imposter syndrome at times where it's like, I got to prove to these folks that I belong here. And again, listen to learn, get to know the folks on the board, get to understand the organizational mission, bring what you have as a skill set to the table and respect the skill set of, of others. And I think that's super important. That's back to, again, what you're getting out of your Atkinson MBA is the ability to work in teams with folks that might have a disparate viewpoint, but are trying, you're working towards a common goal of completing that group project. And so you know, that very much the same way in the board. And so I, I think that's that's really important. Yeah. yeah. Do you think those are all like new skills you've had to craft or like learning how to differentiate the two? Yeah, I'll talk to my kids at Rucker. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's something you have to be aware of. You know, when you walk into a, a board meeting, whether it was when I was on school board, which thank goodness I'm no longer on school board. I don't think that'd be a lot of fun right now. Uh, but you know, you, you've got to you you've got to to change your perspective. Uh, and so I think I learned that. Um, and I I'd like to think that I've been a I've always enjoyed team sports. I like being a team player, and I think you just have to to tune into that. And and, and so I, I think I've gotten better at that over the years. So. Um you serve on both for-profit and non-profit boards, which is really interesting because we're learning a lot about the difference yeah. between the two. Um, so besides different end goals, uh, could you please describe what else is different? Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind on the, the three that I'm involved with is the top line. So uh, on, on a bank board, you have uh, line of sight and you're working with the team and you can control the top line. You can work on getting more deposits and making more loans, making better investments. Uh, when I compare that to the Ford Family Foundation, we have an endowment. And what we are working with from that endowment is we have a spend that the IRS says we have to spend or there's tax consequences. So you kind of have a known top line. Yeah, it can vary. If the market's up, we're going to have more to spend. But you have a little less control over that top line. And, um, and and so, and then at OBRC, uh, we're really dependent upon how many bottles of cans get sold. You know, there's really no other control of top line. All three have to worry about a bottom line. You know, so you've got, everything's got to work through. And so you, you've got staffing issues. You've got allocation of resource issues. You've got to make sure you're on track with, with your mission. So that there's a lot of similarities as you get down into the workings of the business. But I would say that how you get the top line, the inputs um, can, can vary significantly. 
So um, what personal brand positioning or networking did you do to make yourself known? Because I think we're all in a networking stage too. So maybe we can learn from you. So I did get some pre-read questions on that. <laughs> I don't think I have a personal brand. No, I just want to encourage some brand. You know, my encouragement um, is dive in in life. I mean, and that's get involved. And that's, uh, I, I, I think that was so key for the opportunities that I've gotten later on in my career was just diving in and doing some stuff. So, you know, I, when I got to Eugene, get, get involved in the Chamber of Commerce, uh, get involved. I got involved with Kids Sports, the youth sports organization. Got then got involved with the City Eugene Budget Committee. I was on the City Eugene Budget Committee for six years. Learned a lot about city government. Met a lot of people. That led to doing the school board thing. And it just kind of, it just, it keeps going and, and it keeps challenging you. I mean, I think it's, it keeps you fresh. Uh, you can get stale if you are staying just in your lane on your, in your job each and every day. And it's fulfilling. I mean, you get out there and you see yourself outside of your, your daily routine. You can work on things that are your passion uh, outside of hopefully your work is your passion too but there, you might have personal issues of your passion. And if you start doing those things, good stuff happens. I mean, you just, you start, you avail yourself to other opportunities, but I just encourage you to, to dive in, be uncomfortable. That imposter theory I mentioned, you just embrace it. You're going to walk into some rooms and go, what did I sign up for? And, uh, <laughs> and you give it a shot. And if you, if you give with your heart and thought and listen, you're you're gonna come out of it with, with more tools and, and a lot of strengths. So, so um, yeah, yeah. We were speaking earlier about how it's important to hedge your bets in terms of what you distribute, mm -hmm. and also uh, consumer habits have shifted as a result of the pandemic. So I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit further on what you see as like one of the biggest uh, growth opportunities in the future uh, for your company. Yeah. Um. Well, I mean, if I'm getting really granular, uh, it sure would be nice to have a solid uh, hard seltzer product on the alcohol side. I mean, that's and that's really been ruled by the big boys. And so right now we're trying to see, you know, we've got some good regional options, but trying to see if we can help ignite those. And so uh, ready to drink cocktails are going to be huge. They're just scratching the surface right now. And so... You know, the high noons and the cut waters and those things you see out there, uh, you know, there is going to be a push to get those uh, into retail. They're not there now. Uh, I think that potentially could happen. And so that's going to change the landscape. So trying to be aware on that front, uh, I think, you know, on the, it's been interesting on the full end vending front. You know, I talked about these, I mentioned micro market, I think that has completely changed our business. We used to buy the vending machines, and they were going to be 6,000 a piece. And then we got in this deal where, so you'd have seven of those. You got 42 grand in a lunchroom, and you're hoping to get a return on it. Now, you've got an iPad, and you put up a bunch of racks, a couple cameras to ensure you got security. Now, consumers can come in, touch the product, make sure the sandwich is stale, you know, all, all that stuff, and boom, sales go up 50%, and your cost of infrastructure is cut by 50%. So continuing to find opportunities to use technology to get closer to the consumer, I, I think on that side of the business. Uh, and then we're gonna have to, uh, you know, we're somewhat dependent upon PepsiCo, but we're, we're gonna have to continue to, to find the next big thing um, on the NA side, on the non-alcoholic side, uh, and yet not lose track of uh, you know, package portion. So I mean, there, there will be, Right now, the seven and a half ounce can on carbonated soft drinks, that has has been helpful. I think we're gonna be looking at portion sizes and, and, and where people are having. You see Coke right now, uh, I think they've done a very brave thing in saying um, uh, that they're zero calories and best tasting Coke. And so they've taken it from black to red. So it looks like the old Coca-Cola. And so they're making a bet on where people are gonna go and demands are on lower calories. So I think we're going to have to continue to find lower calorie beverages that, that people prefer. Yeah. 
So we are in our final minutes of this event. So really, this is an opportunity to circle back to anything you want to touch on again, share final thoughts, and then we will thank everyone in the room and online who's joined us so far today. This has been great. I just want to tell you all how honored I am to be here today. I really appreciate it. It's been great to come back. As I said, I can't believe it's been almost 30 years. I feel like I can remember sweating it out up there, taking Earl of Trails accounting class and trying to figure out what was going on. And so, you know, those, and, uh, so I, I, I feel you, I, and I'm excited for you because I think this education you're getting, to me, it was the best thing that I did. Um, frankly, it gave me confidence. You know, I was a communication major, and uh, and so it gave me confidence that I I could be a good business journalist, and that's really what I've been doing ever since. Uh, you can understand business generally, communicate with people, have good interpersonal skills, and this is going to help you so much. So I'm, I'm just excited for you all. Uh, talk to my, old, my oldest daughter just completed her MBA back in New York, so she's she she drank the Kool Aid, and so uh, I'm excited excited for you guys. So thanks so much for allowing me to come back and ask us such great questions, and it's a great day. Thank you.